Uh, first, I would like to thank the Congregation of St. Anne's for welcoming us and welcoming me to this prayer service. I'm going to talk to you about a journey that I took with my parents. My father, born in 1919 in Lublin, Poland. My father was the youngest of 16 children. His other siblings, believe it or not, were all girls. <laughs> My father was a young student in Lublin in 1939. And in September of 1939, according to the Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, Hitler agreed not to invade Poland. He told, he told the Prime Minister, if you let us have the Sudetenland, we won't, we won't go any further. We won't put our tanks and armies out there. <coughs> but of course, Hitler and the Germans lied. And in September of 1939, they did invade Poland. Small country, but it had a very, very large Jewish population in the towns of Warsaw, Lodz, and my father's hometown of Lublin. He and his family, his sisters, his brother-in-laws, his cousins, and his parents were all rounded up and taken to the ghetto of Lublin, Poland. There, my father became a kind of a instigator and uh, a starter of the resistance. There was some Jewish young men and women who were not just going to go quietly and listen and be threatened. So he fought. He fought with whatever he had, with his friends. And one afternoon, he came home for Shabbat services, and his mother told him, Tolik, the Nazis were here, the Gestapo was here earlier today, and they were looking for you. They want you to report to their headquarters as soon as possible. They want to talk to you. And my father knew that Talking meant imprisonment, or even worse. What he did, he escaped. He and about 14 or 15 of his comrades escaped. Lublin is right on the border between Poland and the Ukraine. He was held by the Russian police for about three days and was let go. And what he did, he and his comrades knew of a, another resistance group of young Ukrainian Jews in the town of Krimachuk. In the town of Krimachuk, he met up with another group of resistance fighters. And one of those happened to be a young lady named Manya. 
And they got along well. They started, like any young couples, they started seeing each other and dating. And, and they were married in the summer of 1940. They both continued fighting, but the one thing they could not do was stay at home. That's where the Nazis were looking for them. In the area right below Kiev, about 50 miles south of Kiev, there is a network of caves, the priest grotto network of caves. There, this group of young Jewish men and women who basically all they wanted was to be left alone, go to, go to school, whatever they needed to do. But the Nazis wouldn't let them. The Nazis invaded the Ukraine and as it was, these young group of fighters hid. Not only did they hid in the forests of Ukraine, but they also hid in the caves of Priest Grotto. The Priest Grotto Caves is a large subterranean network of caves. They're large rooms, small rooms. This is where they lived. This is, they came out, they would come out at night looking for food, buying food, stealing food, whatever they had to do. One April after, afternoon, late April afternoon, in one of those caves, I was born. I was born inside one of those caves. My mother and my father tried to do the best for me, but there were hardships. One evening when they went out as a group, they knew that there was a convoy of German tanks coming through on their way to Kiev. And in the ensuing fight, when they blew up a bunch of trucks and whatever they could, they used Molotov cocktails, they used guns, they used whatever they had. In that particular battle, my mother was very, very, very badly wounded in her upper right leg to the point where my father had to make a decision. His decision was, I need to get medical attention, I need to get my wife to a hospital in Kiev, or he would lose her. But he couldn't be burdened schlepping a young infant son with him so he made the decision to leave me. He told his friends that I will be back, but I need to get atten medical attention for my wife. Eight weeks later, my father did return. And lo and behold, I was still alive. and had some problems, diphtheria, dysentery, but I guess by the will of whoever, I made it, we made it through. The problem was that my mother could no longer do what she was doing. She could no longer go out and shoot and Hearing some of the stories from her later on while I was sitting with her, and she told me she was a pretty good shot. 
So they left. Now, they didn't leave and go into Western Europe or back home into Poland. They left and went further east, a lot further east. They went to an area called Krosnow. Krosnow is a town where they, my father got a job in a bakery with the Russian army and my mother in the best way that she could took care of me and basically that's where they lived for the rest of the war. My father worked for the Russian army in one of the camps in a bakery and in late 1943 was captured and put into prison by the Russians for stealing bread. He stole food for his family. And just so happened at that time my mother was pregnant with my sister Anne. My father was released from prison in September of 1945, when the war ended. But he and his friends that he was surrounded with had to make the decision that life under communism was not going to be much better for the Jews in Russia than it was under the Nazis. They had to escape. Their next part of the journey was to try to escape to the American zone of Austria. And from Austria, they wanted to go to Eretz Israel, Israel. My father and his friends either bought or stole or bribed, but somehow were able to get a train engine and two cattle cars, large cattle cars. And we boarded those cattle cars and left for Austria. It's about 1,800 miles. That trip took nine and a half weeks. That's part of trip. Before we get to Austria, let me just tell you about my family. That picture, that's my grandmother and my grandfather. They had five children, three girls, two boys. My mother's Two sisters were part of a Zionist group and in the early 30s actually left Russia, both of them, and went to Israel. And there I still have a very large family in Israel, cousins. Her brothers did not leave. Her parents did not leave. And Later on, my mother found out what happened to her parents and her brothers and their wives. My mother's family were taken from their homes and marched to the fields of Babiyar. I'm sure y'all know Bobby R. is where probably the most heinous atrocity of the war happened. Over a hundred thousand Jews were rounded up, taken out into the fields, given shovels, and there they were ordered to dig. They dug a large trench 
And then as the trench got deep enough, they lined up men, women, children, my grandparents, my uncles and their wives, and their children. And they were shot in the back of the head. And as they fell into the trench, another group of Jews were lined up. So that's what happened to my mother's family. I never got to know my mother's family. Never got to know my grandparents. Never had the pleasure of playing with cousins and family. That picture there, that's a picture of my father's family. That's my father up at the top on the right, my grandparents, his sisters and their husbands. Everyone in that picture were taken from the ghetto of Lublin and taken to Madonic concentration camp outside of Lublin, Poland. And there they were gassed and incinerated. So I never got to know that part of my family. That's what happened to my family. Let's go to Austria. Almost 10 weeks. You've got 187 people. My father, remember that number. He remembered that number. Out of the 187 people, 172 made it to Austria. It was so crowded. The dysentery was so bad. They would be stopped for days at a time because they, had, they knew that if they went on, they would either be sent back. They had to make sure that they didn't meet up with any of the Russian soldiers because they were going to be stopped. Late November, 1945, middle of the night, the train stops, and my father takes me by the hand. My mother is holding my sister Anne, who was very, very, very ill. She was just an infant, and we were almost thrown off the train because by the other people because she couldn't keep quiet. She was crying all the time, but we made it. And it was a cold November night. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where my memory starts. I'm about four and a half years old. My father's holding my hand, and the doors of the boxcar opens up. And what I see is a number of soldiers but one very interesting thing about these soldiers is none of them had a gun. None of them were trying to kill us. I remember being helped off the train by one of these soldiers. He took me in his arms, took my sister in his arms, and they took us away, all the children, they took us away and went into a barrack a large army barrack, and they pretty much, as privately as they could, made us undress because we were lice infested. Not only lice, but all kinds of bugs and stuff like that was just crawling all over us. They started spraying us with a delousing powder. They had to pump and they were spraying us in this the lice and the bugs just fell off of us, and they cleaned us up. And I remember I got my first dose of uh, cod liver oil. <laughs> this is what they gave us to get our strength up. At four and a half years old, I only weighed about 24 pounds. My sister Ann was given back to my mother. We went back and. This was 
a DP camp, a displaced persons camp called Beth Bialik. Beth Bialik was a converted German army camp. And it was dirty. It was just right after the war. I mean, they couldn't get the campus cleaned up as much as, as well as they could. And my father was given two blankets. And he took the blankets and went into the barracks where we were told to go. And he hung them up on strings. And there he told me and my mother and my little sister Ann, that's where we were going to be living. That we didn't have to be afraid anymore. No one was going to try to kill us. You know, there are so many different stories about liberators and the American army after the war. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, I have never, ever seen or had so much love from anybody as my family and I had from the American soldiers at Beth Bialik. They did everything they possibly could to make things normal for us. We were told where we could go get food. We had to get in line, of course, for bread and soup and milk and, and things, you know. Again, no one was trying to kill us. This was not, you know, the most glamorous camp or anything like that. As a matter of fact, I remember we slept on the floors because we had, there was no furniture. There was just, everybody had their own little niche in the, in the camp. We slept on the floor and some of the neighbors that I had during the middle of the night were rats about them, yay big, crawling. You could see them crawling on the pipes and that's, that's what we had. We lived in that camp for about a year, a little over a year, and we were transferred to another camp called Beth Israel in a town called Haline. And Beth Israel was a resort. We had our own room. It was small, maybe about eight by 10, and no furniture. And but we had our own room, there was a window, there was a door. And my father took a job, or a voc vocation of some sort. He became a black marketeer. <laughs> and he was good at it. He would buy cigarettes off American soldiers, watches, jewelry, and that's how he made his living. And to be honest, he did a good job at it. We, had, we did pretty good. My mother was able to take me into Zosburg, into Haline, and buy, buy me clothes. We, we had the run of the camp. We could come and go as we pleased. And as a matter of fact, the picture that you just saw, that was my mother and my father with some of his friends that um, actually spent New Year's Eve in the resort town uh, in the Austrian Alps. That's a picture of my birthday party, I think either six or seven years old. That's me in the middle and my mother behind me. And what you don't see in that picture is uh, my mother's still carrying her cane. And uh, she, she pretty much for the rest of her life had a, a very, very painful existence from that. And uh, my sister Ann is right there below me. And, and the guys on the left, those are all my friends. We ran around, we had, we, again, we, we were six, seven years old, we had fun. American soldiers, they played soccer with us, they, we, they, you know, basketball and, and all kinds of things. And just one little story, in the afternoons, we, we all knew, all of us knew that there would be a convoy of soldiers coming through the main gate. And as, as we ran up to the main gate and we would wave our little American flag that we were given, the American soldiers off the back of their jeeps and would throw Hershey bars at us. 
I mean, we had not only single Hershey bars, sometimes they would throw whole boxes of Hershey bars. It was only Hershey bars. For some reason, I guess the Hershey company, you know, had a, had a contract or something. But this is the way it was. The American soldiers, in the five years that we lived in the two camps, were unbelievable. But we were waiting to go to Israel. We couldn't get into Israel. I mean, I'm sure y'all know about England, you know. The uh, English would not let anybody go because they were afraid of the Palestinians for whatever reason. One afternoon, a group from the International Relief Organization came into the camp and said, anybody who wants to go to the United States, <coughs> sign up. And my father wasn't home, and my mother really didn't think much about it, but she went ahead and signed up anyway. She signed up, and about, I want to say, a year later, we were given our visas to go to the United States. Those are our neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Shapiro. They lived right across the hall. He was a barber in the camp. The only barber in the camp, you could, you know, you could, people would just line up, you know, especially on Friday afternoons, you know, for Sabbath. That's me on the left in 1948. My mother got me in a suit, dressed me up for Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur. Again, there were two beautiful synagogues, and on the high holidays, the camp became so peaceful. You could hear, because they had the microphones, they had the loudspeaking system, you could hear Kol Nidre prayers through the whole camp. We were allowed to Pray. We were allowed to go to the synagogue. We were allowed to have our traditions. This is what we were given by the American government, the American soldiers, whatever. Picture on the right, during the summer, of course, every Jewish kid in the camp had to go to Hager, had to go to Hebrew school. And we were there wearing my tzitzis on the way. The only person left alive in my father that my father was able to find was this gentleman right here, a second cousin of his. And he pretty much gave my father a lot of information about what happened to his family. That's me and my father on the steps of a Catholic church in Salzburg, Austria. That particular, and I don't remember much about why, but the, the nuns and the sisters of this church took in a lot of the kids from the camp, like a summer camp, because there was a, there was a, a big lake outside, and uh, so they took us in. And I'll be real honest with you, I learned a lot of discipline that summer. <laughs> Uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't talk. I didn't talk back. <laughs> you know, I could. I could. I, talk, I I remember my mother telling me I talked back to the rabbis, but I never talked back to the nuns. <laughs> but they were they were kind, and they they actually spent uh, we spent uh, one week in, in that camp. That's me and my. Family. This is the clothes that were given to us at Beth Bialik. Uh, and my sister, my mother is holding my sister Ethel, who was born in Austria. In September of 1950, we were told we're going to America. Pack up, we're going. On October the 16th, 1950, while we were in the holding camp at Bremenhofen, Germany, we boarded the ship, the USS General Bilal, on November the 16th of 1950.
across the Atlantic. It wasn't a very good crossing. It was, it, we, we were rocking and rolling, I remember. My father got a job in, in the bakery on the ship, and we had food, everything was good. And the day before Thanksgiving of 1950, my father comes down, and because we were, my father and I were in one part of the ship, and my, my mother and my sisters were another, because this was an Army transport ship. I found out later the history of the ship. This was one of the ships that took American soldiers uh, to Normandy for D-Day. My father wakes me up about 3 o'clock in the morning, and he says, there's something you need to see. There's something I need to show you. Come up on deck. I said, okay, so I go up on deck, and at the rail, there's a lot of people standing there. My father and I go up to the rail, and that morning, ladies and gentlemen, to this day, to me, I saw what I felt and my father felt probably the most beautiful sight we have ever seen. She was all lit up. It was cold. I could see the skyscrapers. I had the first time I'd ever seen skyscrapers. And my father told me, he said, we're home. We're in America. We have a new life. And my father and I, over the years, were very, very, very close. And that was the only time in my life not when my mother died, but that morning was the only time in my life that I saw my father cry. We dock, and Ellis Island, of course, and as we walk into this cavernous opening room, and my father gets in line to get us all registered, I have all my registration papers here to give it to us, and I see these uh, ladies in their Red Cross uniforms. They're all rushing up to us, and, and they got these big trays and carrying donuts. First time I'd ever seen an American donut. I mean, I had all the best German and Austrian pastry in, you know, in Austria, but never had an American donut. Fantastic. <laughs> we got our donuts, we got our milk, whatever we needed. And they gave us a little box, well, about like that. And in that box, they was our gift from the American students. That was their community service project, was to pack up these little boxes. And let me tell you what was in my box. I still remember. A white washcloth, a tube of Colgate toothpaste, a toothbrush, that was my first toothbrush, because in the DP camp, we would brush our teeth with our fingers because they gave us tooth powder, not toothbrushes. So my first toothbrush and a bar of Life Boy soap. And at the bottom was a roll of Five Flavor Lifesavers. That was my box. That was my gift. They put us on the train, and we were supposed to go to Newcastle, Indiana. This is not Newcastle, Indiana, is it? No? Okay. The day before we docked at Ellis Island, the state of Indiana closed off their immigration. They had no more room for immigration into the state of Indiana. So, you know, and I, for a while I never even believed my father that this really happened, but in, in the papers that I finally received from the Holocaust Museum of Washington, D.C., on the bottom, it said 990 Broad Street, Newcastle, Indiana, was crossed out and in, in handwritten was Atlanta, Georgia. That's the only reason that we came to Atlanta, Georgia. We get to Atlanta, actually we get to Washington, D.C., and get off the train, didn't know where to go. A young man who was an American soldier comes up to us and tells us, you know, where to go what train, and he goes in his pocket and takes out three brand new 50 cent pieces. I still have mine. He gave one to my sister and one to me. I still have mine. I still carry it with me. It never leaves me. We get to Atlanta. We put up at a hotel. 
They were put up with a family right on Capitol Avenue, right where the Turner Field is now. And that next Monday morning, Grisha Greenblatt became Herschel Greenblatt. James L. Key Elementary School, Mrs. Favors, the principal, put on put my name, whether it was legal or not, I don't know, but th she changed my name. My father took a job with a company called London Iron and Metal Company. A lot of y'all in this room know of the London family, the Feldman family. And Mr. Feldman became very close friends with my dad. And my dad was injured in a truck accident because all he did was take scrap metal. And so he couldn't work anymore. And Mr. Feldman took my father to First National Bank of Atlanta and co-signed a loan of $1,800 for my father. My father bought a small neighborhood grocery store in kind of midtown, an area of midtown Atlanta called Buttermilk Bottom. I don't know if any of you all know it. Buttermilk Bottom was a large black ghetto area right there where the Civic Center is now. There in the middle, from 1952 to 1969, he ran his business. He saw the poverty in that community. Children trying to steal food from the store, and he told them, don't steal, I'll feed you if you need to be. And he opened up a book where he would, you know, let people buy groceries and put his day, put their day down. At the end of the week, they would come and pay him. So this is how he did business. My father never became the wealthiest man in the world. He was providing wealth for us. This is how he ran his business. One afternoon, a gentleman walks into my father's store, Dr. King. <laughs> Dr. King and my father, for two or three years, became very, very, very close. Dr. King would come and just sit there and listen, and my father would tell him of the things that happened. And they, you know, I mean, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. King twice when I came to pick up my dad and take him home. My dad never drove. And at that time, of course, I didn't really know the greatness of this gentleman. He was just, he sat there with his, doc, he, had a, he drank Dr. Pepper, and that was it. I grew up in Atlanta. My sisters grew up in Atlanta. And that's my family. That's my wife, Rochelle. Rochelle Berger, very prominent Jewish family. And my brother, George. My brother, George, was born in the United States. So all four of us were born in different countries. Below me is my son, Jeff. My son, Jeff grew up, had three children, and he, now my son Jeff is a senior vice president of one of the largest food brokers up in New England. The two gentlemen sitting behind my sisters, my sister Anne on the left, my sister Ethel, Harlan Perlman, Stuart Grossman, fought in Vietnam, they were both officers in Vietnam, came back, decorated soldiers in Vietnam. These are the type of men that my sisters married. My sister Anne is holding my, sister, my nephew David. My nephew David works for the state of New Jersey as a medical ethics uh, professor. He teaches medical ethics up in New Jersey. That's the kind of man my nephew David grew up to be. My Sister Ethel is pregnant with this picture with my nephew, Harold, who is now a vice president with a large IT company. This is my family. I had a family, finally have a family, because of my parents. 
because of what they went through to get me here, because of what they went through. Yes, I lost, and my father and my parents lost their whole families in a horrific way, in a way that six million Jews were lost. This picture here, my favorite picture, young lady on the left, Erin, my granddaughter, graduated from Eastern Michigan University, magna cum laude, got a degree in education. She now teaches high school Spanish in Charleston, South Carolina. My granddaughter, Hannah, next to her, she's the youngest, she's 16. She goes to Brookwood High School. She started one of the first anti-bullying clubs in Gwinnett County High School. She's an advocate. She's listened to me, we've talked. Next to her, my grandson, Corey, graduated from Clay High School in Toledo, Ohio. First in his class, president of the senior class, president of the student body, and now is on a full academic scholarship at Ohio State University. Next to him is my granddaughter-in-law, Emily. Emily graduated magna cum laude from Ohio State and now teaches special ed in Gwinnett County. She and my grandson, Eddie, moved down here from New York about a year ago. And my grandson, Eddie, who is now in law school here in Atlanta. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a family. With the kindness and the help of a lot of people, the American soldiers, with the tenacity of my parents, my father was one heck of a man. Very, very strong. But he lost his family. My mother had more love in her than any one human being could possibly have for her children. I remember her carrying me in the DP camps. I remember her, just the love that she had. But again, she could shoot a gun better than a lot of men. <laughs> this is why I'm here, this is why I'm talking. There are other atrocities, other stories out there, but a lot of families have lost. This is why we are here. This is why it is such an honor to be standing here in front of St. Ann Church and Exheim Synagogue. This is what it's supposed to be about. And I just want to thank you for letting me talk. It is because of my father's strong will that I, my sisters, and my mother were able to escape the horror of the Holocaust. I want everyone to remember so that it never happens again. Ladies and gentlemen, it can never happen again. But seeing you, seeing the people in this room, seeing the love that we all have for each other, it, it's not going to happen again. We have to be strong. We have to stick together. Yeah. I just want to thank you for letting me talk. This is such a great honor. I, I, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by the, the people in this room and, the, and the, um, this particular service. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>